All right, today's an exciting day. We're going to go through the cleanup to-do list and the upgrade to-do list that I've got for some design things that I've learned how to do better since I first wrote them. So the cleanup to-do list mostly consists of bug fixes and you know suggestions that I got from comments and YouTube from th things people noticed that were either bugs or slight, slightly less than optimal ways of arranging the code that could be better. And so I'm going to take all the ones from those com suggestions that I liked and put them in today. And then there are also some design tweaks. I'm going to change the arena a little bit. We're going to do a much better job with thread context than we did before. Uh, we're going to simplify the memory management layer just a little bit more than we already have. Uh, even though I think it's a pretty simple layer, it's just going to get better. I've spent another year practicing and iterating on how to design that thing, and I think we could stand to upgrade it again. So we're going to do that all in one go today, and let's get into it. All right, so the first slightly interesting thing that's happening on this list is removing the M-base memory thing that I had in the original pass of my uh, code base's memory system. And all this M-base memory thing was doing is it was basically a V table written in C style, so it's a struct of function pointers. And so what it let me do is abstract my reserve, commit, decommit, and release functions. And it abstracted them in such a way that they were able to be changed out at runtime because they're using function pointers. That's a runtime abstraction. The cost you pay for it is uh, that the calls are slower themselves and you have to pass around these function pointers. After having looked at it for a long time and thinking about it in other contexts and you know gaining more experience, I've come to think of this as a mistake. There's two main reasons. One, it's usually just not the case that I need that kind of runtime abstraction. If it was like all the time, then maybe we could discuss this. I still think it might be a mistake to actually build it in at this layer, but it's certainly not common enough that it seems like there's even a discussion in the first place. The overwhelmingly common case is that a particular project is built with one thing as the allocation layer that the whole, the whole program, one particular executable expects to use. The second thing, is that uh, when you go with something like a macro system, which is what I'm switching to, you basically are getting the same amount of abstraction. It's just it's abstraction resolved statically at compile time instead of abstractions that are resolved dynamically at runtime. And whenever you do the resolution, you pay for the, the price of the abstraction then. So I'm paying for the price of the abstraction at compile time now. There's like more macros and pre-processing work that is happening instead of runtime work with pointers. But I think that's a trade-off I'm very much willing to make because, you know, ultimately the final software that comes out of what I do needs to be fast and the com compiler is not going to be that much slower for a few macros here. Uh, it does mean that maybe the interface for plugging allocators into this is a little bit more clunky. It's always just painful to have to use macros because unfortunately the utilities we have for resolving abstractions statically uh, aren't great most of the time. 
So that's a slight downside for sure, but there's a big, big upside to using statically resolved abstractions, and that's that they're actually more general. And what I mean by that is you can take a statically resolved abstraction, and if you really need runtime abstraction, like a runtime dynamic way of dispatching to different allocators, you can just use the static abstraction and define it to use a runtime dispatcher. But on the other hand, if you start with a runtime dispatcher and want to plug in something that has the speed of something that was static resolved, you can't do that. So there are outcomes that you can get from the compiler. There are kinds of programs that are available when you use a static abstraction for this kind of situation that you can't get if you use a runtime resolved abstraction. So hopefully that idea makes sense. I was switching off of M base memory, and so I'm just finding all the places where I wrote that struct. I'm deleting those, and I'm switching all the function calls that were through this fun point function pointer table thing. I'm just switching those to calling a macro, and then I'm putting in some de default values for those macros that will just call to my operating system layer functions. The second interesting thing I'm doing is rather small, but it actually is kind of important. I originally defined the arena in such a way that APIs for creating an arena would return you an arena struct. And so we already took out the M base memory pointer, so the arena got a little bit smaller from that. So what, what's in my struct now is a pointer to the actual block of memory that the arena manages, and then the cursor for the current position, the commit cursor that tells me where my commit range ends, and also the cap, which is how far it can ever commit to, because that's how big the original reserve was. So that's the structure of the arena right now. And what's a little bit strange about this is it means that there are two ranges of memory that are relevant whenever you use the arena. There's the actual arena range that's being managed and allocated from, and then there's this tiny little thing that's the arena struct. And whenever you pass it around, you're passing around a pointer to that tiny little thing, and it has another pointer to the significant chunk of memory. And so there's a layer of indirection there that, you know, is probably costing us a negligible amount of uh, performance based on, you know, how uh, how the complicated the rest of the function is. If you can call a commit inside of an arena push, then it's not a big deal if there's one extra D reference in there, probably unless you're doing lots of one byte allocations or something. It seems unlikely, though, that the extra indirection there is a huge deal. To me, but it could be. It's at least it's at least not a lose to switch to getting rid of that indirection. But the better thing is now I have eliminated a potential mistake, which is that in the old way of using the arena, you could actually copy it by value and pass those values around. So I could have two copies of the arena struct part, both pointing at the same giant block, and then one of them could advance the cursor forward, cause a new range to get committed, and then it might think it doesn't have to do anything on popping and then the other arena can just go from where it was at and mistakenly think the commit is in the wrong spot so it's it's basically like the state of these two arenas can be different from each other uh, even though the block of memory that they're both referring to and trying to manage can't actually have two different independent states so it doesn't actually make a lot of sense to be able to copy by value that block of memory so what i'm switching to is saying that we always pass arenas around by pointer the original api for returning an arena to us won't just allocate an arena and then take the uh arena de details and stuff them in a struct to return to us, it will actually stuff the arena's details itself onto the giant arena buffer, right? So we allocate this giant arena buffer by a reserve, and we commit the very head of that buffer and put in the arena details there. Now the thing we're passing around is a base pointer to the whole big chunk, so we've removed that extra indirection, and we've avoided the possibility of having two independent states of the arena because now if you try to copy an arena if i try to have two different things referencing the same arena block 
then what I'll have is two different pointers to that arena block. So it's kind of nice. It just removes an extra layer of handles that can exist that refer to things that should never actually be independent anyways. And it also means that things like arrays of arenas go from being an array of a fairly large struct to an array of pointers, which is super tight and cool. I like this. So this is what we're doing with arena handles. All right, there's another big thing coming up, which is that I took a look, did some experiments and tests, and I also tried around with a couple of different compilers to see how fluid it is. And it turns out that putting thread context stuff, uh, thread local variable handling into the OS layer is kind of a mistake. At least in the modern world, it doesn't make a lot of sense. For one thing, the OS APIs for thread context handling are actually just much slower than the alternative that I'm introducing here, which is to let the compiler do it. And the way the compiler can do it is that in modern operating systems that we're compiling towards, and in all the compilers we're planning on using, you can mark up a variable as being a thread local. And when you mark up a variable as being a thread local, and by the way, you can do that in C or C++ using the right extensions or versions of the language or whatever, but using marking something up as a thread local means that there's a separate copy of that variable on each thread. And the operating system actually automatically manages the process of creating that memory whenever you create a thread and it gets packed into your executable in a special section so that the operating system knows that these are the variables, this is the range of memory that needs to be copied every time uh, a new thread starts up. And then each thread just has a register dedicated to pointing to its block of thread local memory. And this is really cool because it's a lot faster than going through a system call to iterate through that register's pointer chain and find the variable you're supposed to be using. It's really just like a matter of a couple of offsets in a row um, finds you the thing you want. Uh, you know, a couple of memory reads off of several offsets of things that you already have in a register. There's no, there's no change of context to the kernel or anything like that. It's, it's really good. It works on Windows, it works on Linux, it works on Clang, it works on Visual Studio, uh, works in C, it works in C++. It's, since it's faster, it's easier, it's not uh, something that's very hard to abstract. So this is just like a huge win all around the board. And that's gonna let me get rid of the entire concept of an OS managed thread context, which I actually tried to do last year when I was first building the thread context, but it just didn't really work out. With this technique, it works out so well because you don't even need a thread context. Instead, you have separate pointers in your thread local memory whenever you want this. Now we do probably want to avoid that getting too big. It might start to uh, have some downsides if we overuse it, but uh, it makes a lot of cool tricks very easy to do and makes APIs a lot better knowing how to set up a thread local like this. So the scratch pool is now just going to be a thread local variable that is visible right inside the base layer's memory uh, file. You know, the memory CPP file of our base layer will just directly have the thread context that it needs defined there. And so you don't have to worry about, hey, if, if a new file comes in that wants to, you know, have a new feature in the thread context, but we only want that in this one case, what'll happen? It doesn't matter anymore. The compiler is actually doing the work of figuring out which variables go in the thread context, which is the best of like every possible world in my opinion. So we're switching to this. All right, another kind of minor change, but it, it makes actually a lot of code change in our code base here, but it's a rather minor conceptual change is I just don't really like these scratching and things I put in initially. Uh, I discovered that I find it's even more clear if I can explicitly say where the scratches get released and there isn't actually a lot of advantage to this. In fact, my least favorite part of this is the thing that might seem like the nicest detail, which is that when you create a scratch, you then can pass that around as if it were an arena 
and not have to do anything with it. And that looks really cool. It makes the code look nice, right? It looks like this uh, when you use a scratch and then when you define it, you have to do this weird C++ operator overloading thing that tells it that the scratch struct can automatically cast to an arena pointer using this function. But here's the downside to doing that is once in a while you pass that thing around and then you have to go and debug something, right? So you're stepping into a function and now all of a sudden it doesn't look like it, but your function actually has a function call inside of its first parameter. It's got hidden function call via this operator overloading cast thing. And so you're trying to step into an, a function that's important and you find yourself stepping into the thing in the scratch class thing that casts to an arena pointer and then return it and like it throws you off a little bit and that has annoyed me enough times that one day I just decided I was never going to put that cast thing in there anymore and I would just manually type scratch.arena and it turns out that it's worth it. There's very, very little cost to just saying, hey, this thing I'm moving around here, it's not really an arena, but if you go dot arena, it becomes an arena. And so that's just a better trade-off for me. I can type dot arena once per usage, and when I have to debug something, I won't get thrown off by it. It also means I can delete a lot of code. So I am just happy all around to get rid of this thing and switch to a scratch system that is entirely controlled by the memory layer and not by the OS layer and uh, coincides directly with just creating a temp structure off of an arena pointer. There's nothing else there. There's no destructor. There's no helper constructors. There's nothing else. It's just all the code is gone. It feels really good to me to make this change. All right, there's one last thing that's kind of important, and that's that I've decided when I write a commit function like the one we're using in the arena here, that it's probably appropriate to know whether or not that succeeds because just because memory gets reserved successfully doesn't mean you will be able to commit it successfully. The operating system has a limit to how many committed sections it can handle process and across the entire computer. So it's possible for a commit to fail even though the reserve succeeded. And I would rather just have the ability to know that that's happening in the API, first of all, and then make my code that's using that API appropriate to that possibility, right? So it's like now, instead of just saying, hey, I thought that was committed, and now when you write to the pointer, it crashes and you have to go figure out that, oh, the commit failed. Let's just check if the commit's succeeding. We're already paying a pretty high price to call a function like commit anyway, so let's just check if it's succeeding. And uh, if it's not, make, a, make the error make sense immediately in that moment, right? So that seems like a pretty low friction thing to add in. Now that we're using the uh, macro abstraction especially, it's very easy to change the signature. It'd be a lot more painful if I was still managing function pointers because then you have to handle a lot more type signature matching work. So th this, uh, this is just a nice, quick, easy change and the code doesn't get much more complicated for it either. It's just we have to throw in an extra failure path and that's not a really big deal. It was gonna fail anyway, so now it's just explicitly catching the failure a little bit more. All right, that's it for this one-off video going through our cleanup and upgrades to-do list. Uh, with that out of the way, we've got some cool new stuff coming up. We won't be getting back to our regular arc right away. There's some other stuff first that I'd like to spend some time on, but we can start moving forward with doing new cool stuff with the code base now, which I'm very excited for. So I'll see you guys around. Bye-bye. Thank you.